I greet you all in the name of Jesus. Good morning. It's my great joy to be able to open God's word with you this morning. My name is Harrison. I serve as one of the elders here, uh, serving alongside Pastor Fidel and uh, Elder Peter, Elder John, and Patrick. It's a joy to be able to be gathered here. Uh, for a long time, we haven't been gathered as much as we are today. We so rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness that he has held us fast throughout this otherwise very difficult period. I think we are on week five of our sermon series through Sermon on the Mount, Christ Confronting Culture. We have ten weeks to go. That's exciting, I hope. Uh, from the beginning of September till the end of the year, we are looking at these very countercultural words of Jesus that are written for us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 through 7. You might not think we have come very far because we have only started the reading once again from verse 1 and went, away, uh, went all the way to verse uh, 16. Perhaps uh, in the coming weeks we might begin taking on bigger chunks. Today, our focus will be on Christian influence, that is, being sought and light. The big idea of our sharing today is that the king calls his kingdom people to influence the world around them through their good deeds for the glory of their heavenly father. If that was a bit chunky to take in, I will say it again. That the new king calls his kingdom people to influence the world around them through their good deeds for the glory of their heavenly father. But let me open by asking you a question. It's a very simple question. Would you like to be famous and influential? I don't suppose a lot of people would answer that question honestly in church. But the question is simple. Would you like to be famous, that is well known, and influential, affecting how people um, think or even live? I think a lot of people would actually want that. And some time back, a book was published that speaks exactly to that need. You probably see the cover of it on the, um, on the screens, but in the year 1936, an American author, a gentleman called Dale Carnegie, published this quite popular book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Maybe some of you even have a copy of it. This book went on to sell some 30 million copies worldwide and millions more read it. So popular was this book that Time magazine ranked it number 19 of the top 100 books in the last century. Quite an influential book. People want to know how to win friends and even influence people. The U.S. Library of Congress ranked it as the seventh most influential book in all of American history. And you might wonder, why is the book so popular? And maybe you've never even heard of it. The book is popular because people really want to be influential. People like to leave their mark. I'm sure if we went back to your high school dormitory, somewhere up near the window, there might be Mary was here. Or perhaps even somewhere even more difficult to paint because you don't want them to paint over it years to come. There is still probably your memory somewhere. Your fingerprint is everywhere. Human beings have always wanted to leave a mark. Whether in caves or in paintings, people want to grow influence. I actually tried to buy the book earlier this week for demonstration purposes today. So I went to the textbook center, arguably the biggest bookseller in this city or in Nairobi, and I realized they have ran out of copies. They didn't have any in stock. You might wonder, goodness, why is this book so 
uh, popular with readers is because it promises a number of things. And let me tell you some of the things that this book promises to help the readers in. The first one, the book promises to get you out of your mental rut and give you new thoughts, vision, and even ambitions. You can see it's exactly what people really want. The second thing the book promises to give you is to enable you to make friends quickly and easily. The third thing the book promises is that it's going to increase your popularity. You're going to shoot in your popularity ranking. The book also promises to increase your earning power. Only seven things. But the fifth one, this book is likely to help you to win people to your way of thinking. You want people to think like you? Exactly to influence them to your way of thinking? This is the book. This book also promises to help you to handle complaints, to avoid arguments, and to keep your human contact smooth and pleasant. And finally, it promises to increase your influence, your prestige, and even your ability to get things done. Don't be under the impression that I have the books out there and I want you to buy them. No. But clearly, I hope you can see why the book is out of stock. Because people crave for influence, only that they go about it the wrong way. At the center of Dale Carnegie's book is me or you. The book makes you the king. It is like Sunday Bidra's book, Crown Your Customer. It makes you the king. And then tries to build a kingdom around you. Very much similar to the heart of idolatry, which is usually the individual. And so in its hunger for worship, for attention, and even for popularity, the book, I mean the world, buys itself these and many other self-help books that are in our shelves today. Jesus Christ, however, in the passages that we have read and elsewhere, calls his people to a different mindset. This new king, who has been unveiled, as we have seen in the earlier chapters of Matthew, wants and teaches his followers a new path, and indeed a very different path from the rest of the world. One, you will notice that he is with a crowd of simple, unlearned guys on the Mount of Olives. He wants them to have global influence. You can imagine if a company is having a meeting and thinking about global takeover or going global. They would have a very special strategic planning meeting. They might want to read this kind of a book here. But Jesus meets with his people up on a mountain, on a rugged Mount of Olives. They are not your ordinary executives with sharp suits, long CVs, or high career aspirations. But they are a bunch of former fishermen, tax collectors, and ordinary people without much of an education. And he gives them a strategy for global influence, which is very different from the way the world thinks. And as we are going to see in these four verses, there are three important lessons that we learn about how Jesus wants to run a global takeover. Three lessons then. The first one is by him calling out a community. Come with me to verse 13. He says to them, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? 
It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Then he says in 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You might have noticed as I was reading that, I was emphasizing the words you in verse 13, the word you in verse 14, and also in verse 16, your light and your good works and your Father who is in heaven. And one of the most striking things that I learned from this passage is actually just found in the grammar of the words of Jesus. You would possibly notice that he addresses his people collectively as in you in plural rather than you in singular. You might not be able to pick that in the English translation because the word you in English could be both singular for you as an individual, but it can also be you collectively as plural or together as a united body. In the original, the word you here, which is then translated into English, is actually in plural. If you want to double check that with me, think of how these words have been translated in your mother tongue or in your, uh, perhaps in your first language. In the Bible, in your first language, you know, most likely you will hear those words are in plural. It's the English that does not put it in plural because you is you, whether to an individual or to a group of people. In Swahili, the word is nini in some Swahili translation, or nini dio chumvi ya ulimwengu, which means sio wewe, which is you as an individual, lakini ni nini, that is you collectively. You see, whenever I read these words in the past, I used to think Harrison. I used to think of myself as an individual. And I used to think that I am the one to be the salt of the world. Which is, of course, quite odd and even lacking in humility that I would think of myself as being individually the salt and the light of the world. Logic breaks the moment I myself as an individual think I am the light that the world needs, or indeed I am the sword that the world is actually looking for. And actually what we see here in this passage is that Jesus is teaching his disciples collectively. As we noticed in verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when, his, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opens his mouth and taught them collectively, as a group of people. So our calling here and our listening to these words is actually unitary. I don't want to mean that there is no individual or personal application. There might well be that. But we need, first of all, to hear these words as a community of those whom Jesus has called. We have been called as a community. We have been saved as a community. You see, this idea of Jesus is my personal savior is actually a little bit alien to the pages of scripture. Oftentimes, the idea of our salvation is that we are the saved community. Our identity in the pages of scripture is more communal and less individualistic. Yani, Tumeitwa kama kikudi. Tumekusanyika kama jamii ya wanao mpenda na wanao mfuata Yesu Kristo. So that everything we do has a communal aspect to it. Our worship is communal. Our discipleship is in the context of a community. Our service, whether it is in singing 
all in, um, all in giving our time, all it is in supporting the needy, has a sense in which it needs to be communal. Friends, our influence for Jesus Christ in our world would also be unitary and communal. How might we then be able to hear that even before I go to the analogy or to the metaphors that Jesus uses? I'd like to remind us that our identity is in our unity as a church. You see, when Jesus uses the illustration in verse 15, people do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but understand it gives us an aspect or an idea that we would well be advised to take note of. Because Paul, in 1 Timothy, is going on to call the church, it is the pillar and the stand place or the stand for the light of the gospel. In other words, kanisa ni mahali pa kuekelea ijiri. Ili watu wata wa dunia waweze kuyona na waweze kumtukuza mungu. We best express our faith and action as a community of believers. If you take out a Christian from their faith community, they are done. Friends, show me a Christian who is not committed to a local church. And I will show you a brother or a sister walking in defeat. We need to listen to these words and steer away from our me-centered individualistic worldview and embrace a biblical Christ-centered outlook for life and for ministry. Sio mimi pekea ni meitua ama wewe pekea ko umeitua. Lakini tumeitua na tumeokolewa. I know some people get disappointed when we don't have extended periods of individual prayer. Today we had two sessions. Brother Mukenga gave us a few minutes at the beginning of the service and Pastor Fidel also at some point allowed us a few minutes of individual prayer. And this, you know, that's important. But we had long moments of corporate prayer. And I'd love to encourage you to think more corporate, especially when we are gathered, rather than individual. Isn't it interesting that in today's catechism question, there was that reference to including the prayer that Jesus taught us. And what is that prayer? How does it begin? Our. It doesn't say my father. It actually says our father. In other words, it's a corporate prayer. So when you pray, Jesus teaches his disciples, and we're going to come to it in a few weeks from now, say our father. Jesus presumes prayer that you will be praying corporately. We need to hear this. Because the world around us feeds us a me-centered, individualistic diet that places me in the middle of the action, throws Christ outside completely, and lifts me up, perhaps because I can consume, perhaps because I can buy a certain product. Not so with Jesus' people. We need to remember we are called to be part of the community of Jesus. And that community of Jesus is the local church. It is the community he said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Friends, quit being part of sideshows that try to take away from the church of Jesus Christ. Usikae mbali. Ingia kanisani na umweza kuweza kumtumikia mungu. Don't be on the fridge or on the edges of involvement. Because God has chosen to work primarily through his church. When I was growing up, there was a sister who was teaching us the Bible. 
And she was called Jane. And she used to give us illustrations from time to time. And I guess it's now coming back to me. I'm be telling a lot of stories nowadays. So Jane used to tell us a story that if you want to go swimming in a river, not a great idea, Tim. If you want to go swimming in a river, don't swim on the edges. Because you know, on the edges, matope, crabs, and all sorts of little animals, creeping crows, they are all there on the edges. Lakini ukita kuagere vizuri ingia dani. Ingia dani kabisa. And there, you will have a good swim. You will enjoy the flow. You will enjoy the time when you are there. Lakini wa kristo wengi wanakaa mbali sana. You know, they are observing from a distance. Jesus calls his people to identify as his and to serve as his people. There are no other ground Christians. Water to meet, water to make Whether it is in praise and worship. Or in the choir. We don't have a choir. We should have a choir. There probably are people gifted with those gifts. They need to come forward and serve the Lord. Being involved in Christian service as the Lord has called us as a community. But how else are we going to spread our influence or the influence of Jesus? The first one was by calling us out as a community. The second one of three is by calling them, that is the church, to actively influence the world around them. You see, you could have a community, but it is not a community of influence. There are many communities that are formed, but they may not necessarily be seeking to bring about change in their world. So we see then, in verse 13 and 14, Jesus giving us an example Saying, you, collectively, as God's people, are the salt of the earth. Then he also says, in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And what's Jesus doing? He uses two commonplace items that every one of his hearers would have known. Everyone would have identified with these things, salt and light. And he, he goes on to talk about their attributes, saying, If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under feet. In other words, salt is only meaningful if it gives flavor to food. If it is not there, then it is useless. Light is only good if it is in its place where it is put up somewhere and then it illuminates the whole room. No one in their right senses would light a lamp and then cover it with a basket, Jesus teaches. The normal thing is to put it somewhere so that it can give light to all the people in the room. Salt has this flavor giving quality. And light has this illuminating quality. Both of these uh, commonplace illustrations point to the active, positive influence that God's people are to have in an otherwise tasteless and dark world. You see, God's people, both salt and light are outward looking by nature. They do not draw attention to themselves, but actually serve another. I don't know who has ever visited a house and they were using a certain type of salt and after the food, they were wondering, I wonder what salt that is. Do you have the recipe for that salt? Nobody talks about it. Nobody talks, you know, where, where did you get that brand of salt? Salt, by its nature, serves another's purpose. 
Everyone can come after you ask, well, what, that was a very tasty meal. It was very special. I wonder where you got that from. And you can then begin sharing the videos on YouTube of how you made it. As you get them to subscribe to your channel. But salt will remain hidden, unmentioned, and yet it's such an important component to the meal. Because the food would otherwise be blood and tasteless. It doesn't draw any attention to itself, but actually seeks to serve another. Jesus says, believers likewise are not to conceal the truth they know, but they are to let it shine for all to see. So let's break that a little bit further and see how does Jesus want his people to influence the world. One of the things I would love for us to learn is that he needs them to appreciate that the world is different without Christ. What is it? Simply by use of this analogy, Jesus alludes to the fact that the world would otherwise be tasteless and dark, full of sin and evil. In other words, the world without Jesus is in dire need of the flavor of the gospel and of the light of Jesus Christ. It is the people of Jesus' kingdom who will need to bring his kingdom influence to this world. That is indeed the sad state of our world. Without Jesus, it is tasteless and it is dark. It is lonely and it is hopeless. It is full of murder and of oppression. It is full of corruption and it is full of violence. But believers, first and foremost, will need to understand that the world is different from the church. I think we can run into the mistake of assuming or blending in too much with the world. and Therefore, blurring any distinctiveness or any difference between the world out there and the church or the kingdom of Jesus in there. John Stott says, the influence of Christians in our society depends on their being distinct and not in being identical with the world. An important lesson for us to learn there, this is not our kingdom. I said it last Sunday, I'll say it again, and James says that in the middle of the week, as we read it in 1 Peter, that we are strangers and aliens in this world. Our influence largely depends on being distinct, that is being different, rather than being identical with the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on to add that the glory of the gospel is that when the church is different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message even though it hates it at first. It is when the church preaches the gospel rather than self-help. What the world is preaching is self-help. What false teachers also teach is self-help. And that doesn't win anyone to the kingdom. It only helps people to perhaps pump their egos. It is when the gospel is preached Piercing words of Jesus are taught that the world pays attention. These are people of a different spirit. We are called to influence the world. But we are not going to influence the world if we are trying to identify with the world and to become like it. You are in the world, says Jesus in John's gospel, but you are not of it. But then what would it look like to be sought and light? Notice, I'm only using these two illustrations as one because both of them illustrate the same point, which is in verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that it may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so I come to the question, what does it look like 
to be salt and light. Well, we don't have to guess it. We don't have to speculate or try to draw out the illustration of salt beyond what Jesus says. Well, he already tells us, in verse 16, by doing good deeds. What are these good deeds? These are the very things that he has taught us before in the Beatitudes. How do we spread the influence of Jesus? Not by publishing, perhaps, you know, grossly selling books, millions of copies. How do we spread the influence of Jesus? Not by shiny branding and perhaps by nice sounding words, but actually by good deeds, both deeds of faith towards God and deeds of love towards other people. Friends, to be sought and light in a way that God approves of is to be poor in spirit. It is to mourn for our sin and the brokenness of our world. It is to be meek and not to seek attention. It is to hunger and to thirst for righteousness. It is in being merciful for those who are in need of our help. It is by being pure in our hearts. It is by being peacemakers like we learned last Sunday. It is by being ready to suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Might assume that spreading our influence is perhaps being popular or being an influencer on Instagram. But it's actually wearing these attributes, the beatitudes that Jesus has already taught us. But how might we then apply this? Well, it is actually by doing these things and not being a passive community that just leaves and lets live. We are not a quiet and influential people. Like salt, wherever we land, we are to cause some influence. You see, you cannot taste salt and miss it. Likewise, you cannot encounter a true believer and miss the fact that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself compares his kingdom to a city that cannot be hidden. Believers cannot then be hidden. Light will be visible even from a far distance. May the Lord then help us to glorify him in our distinction from the rest of the world. We are to actively love and serve God in the context of the local church. And we are to spread his influence to all around us in all the spheres of our lives. The third and the last point, how else do we spread an influence for the name of Jesus? The third point is by showing them, this is how Jesus shows his people how to spread his influence, he shows them the goal and motivation of their influence. Verse 16, part B, where Jesus says, I'll begin from the first part of the verse, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Friends, the whole point of being sought and light is the glory of our Father. Other people are to see the good deeds, that is, the church displaying the gospel, and God is then glorified in that. See, God is glorified when other people see Christ likeness in us. He is the one working in our sanctification to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. When other people see the fruit of the gospel in us, they glorify God. On the contrary, God's people, the Lord's name suffers when believers are not known to bear fruit 
of righteousness. We are the glory bearers. But we can also bring the Lord's name to shame and dishonor when our conduct is not in line with God's word. Very sadly, this week, a very well-known Christian leader was in the news for gross, perhaps unrepentant, moral failure. We were discussing this in some group, and you could see the disappointment and the heartache that it causes when Christians are on the wrong side and are not seen to glorify the Lord. Friends, we are called as a community and our calling is so that we can display the glory of God. A reason for existence is so that God is glorified. Our meaning of life is so that God's name is lifted on high. We exist for the sole purpose of the display of of the glory and the majesty of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, that is the motive. That is the goal of our influence. What I ask the book I opened this sermon with tries to get you your own glory, tries to get you your own influence, Jesus calls you to be decreasing so that he and God would be increasing. So why do you do then what you do? Whose glory do you seek? Are you after your own glory like the rest of the world? Or are you after the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? The world seeks its own glory and influence. The stuff we consume, including books, are also telling us to seek our own glory, name, and influence. Our sinful hearts can easily be tempted to pursue our own glory and influence. Jesus teaches his people not to seek their own glory, but the glory of God. They are the ones who would want to diminish so that Christ would be magnified. But can I also give us that in there, there is also a warning. Look at what Jesus says um, in verse 13b. If salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Jesus almost asking a question of, is that even possible, you would wonder. He's almost saying that if salt is not salt, what else is it good for? And Jesus says it's good for nothing really. It can only be thrown outside. In other words, if it is not serving the glory of God, bringing the saltiness to the flavorous world we live in, then it is irrelevant and pointless. There is no need to light a lamp and then cover it. And we, I think we need to hear that as a church family. That we run the risk of being irrelevant, useless, perhaps even toxic if we are not salty or if we are not emanating light. If our aim is to draw attention to ourselves, then we are no longer good for the kingdom. Our place perhaps would be to be thrown out and to be trampled upon, using Jesus' illustration, under feet by men. Ours is a most lowly place, pointless and indeed useless. Hear this right. Our calling is to glorify another. Our purpose is the taste of Jesus in the world around us. Our task 
is to shine forth that others may see the good deeds we do and not glorify us, but glorify our Father who is in heaven. So do people see Jesus in you? I referred to John 12 earlier on at the opening of the sermon and also inferring from the song we had just sung. Sir, we would see Jesus. Do others see Jesus in you, in your words, in your posts on social media, in your status updates? What is it always about you? Who is glorified? Who is at the throne of your life? Who is the king of your kingdom, as, as it were? Do others sense Jesus? Are you that flavor or that smell of Christ in an otherwise rotten, dark, and decaying world? Lord, we desire that we would honor you. His words pierce us deeply. They describe just what we are not. And even as I preach them, Lord, I see just exactly what I am not. And how we long that we would radiate Jesus. How we long that we would diminish that Christ would be exalted. Lord, we are those who seek after our own name and fame. Please bring us to a place of saying with John the Baptist that we are not worthy to even untie the strings of your shoes. Grant that we would decrease and that you would increase. Grant that the name of this church would not be the name or the branding of this church, but that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ would be known. Please grant that we would not be known for nothing else but Christ and him crucified. Please forgive us for when we've been caught up in the vain glory of seeking our name and fame. Forgive us for when we are running after books like Dale Carnegie's and trying to just grow our influence. Call us away from that path of idolatry and bring us back to the narrow path of worship. Bring us back to the path of giving the glory to the Lord. And we ask these things for ourselves as individuals and for us together as a church family. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.